Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's podcast. This is Rockstar Superhero number 12. And today I sit with my very close friend, Edmund Wong. A lot of people, again, <laughs> again, have no idea who this guest is. And that's okay. Uh, Edmund's story is really unique. He's an immigrant from Malaysia and uh, lives in the Seattle, Bellevue, Washington area and is just an incredible friend, mentor, uh, leader, friend. Did I say friend? Uh, friend. Uh, he's a little bit of everything. Um, I highly encourage you to listen to the whole story. Uh, it's an hour and 40 minutes of one man's journey through life. Uh, coming from a very troubled and distressing home in uh, Malaysia, uh, a, a broken family, if you will, and broken relationships, and what comes from that, and how his brokenness in life led him to another country, and led him to the woman of his dreams, and led him to the miracle of his children. And man, he's just a great guy. I've known him for well, a little over eight years now, and um, we're really close. We went through a period of time where we weren't really close. We actually don't discuss that on the podcast, why, but uh, needless to say, life has challenges, and sometimes uh, you question relationships, and there was a period of time where Edmund and I um, weren't so sure if um, we were, I don't know, the right people for each other in our lives, and I'm happy to say and proud to say that not only did we figure that out, uh, but we became very close. And uh, so I'm just super happy to share his story with you guys today. I think you're really going to dig it. It's very different. Very, very, very different. Certainly from last week. Last week was all rock star. And uh, this week is all superhero. So hey, isn't that amazing? So anyway, with that, um, hope you have a killer time. Hope you enjoy this. This is a very soft interview. Uh, it is not a high energy interview, but I think you really dig the introspection. So, uh, man, what else to say? Have a blast, dig in, rock and roll, superhero. We are here at the Wong household in a beautiful, beautiful breakfast nook. Hence the boomy room because, you know, I think I think the kitchen and the dining area is about the size of my house. <laughs> nice to make you uncomfortable right off the bat. <laughs> You're just funny that way. No. As you hold the world's best mentor coffee cup. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me and the wealth I've accumulated. <laughs> well, that's my only coffee cup that I go to every morning. I just stick my hand up to the cupboard, and, and that's the thing that comes out. Oh, really? <laughs> it's the a best, gift. The best part of waking up. Um, so I want to make sure, like, without giving you too much grief, I want to make sure you keep the mic, you know. Try not to cover the diaphragm. Try to Try to either, yeah, try to hold it, yeah, like that, and keep it within within like say three inches of your mouth would be nice they call it radio technique where you're actually on the microphone like this oh do i not get a screen uh i can go get you no, one. no i'm just kidding i might sing because you know? you're because you're afraid you're gonna pop, pop, pop all day long that's what i learned that <clears throat> if i if i just point it like this yeah the way it's supposed to be <laughs> yeah which is a mono right this is a directional uh unidirectional Oh, uni. Okay, so yeah. I could I could do this. I yes. still okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I was holding like this, but then I realized my breathing coming down. No, it's actually. I mean, that microphone is actually made for that exact purpose. Oh, okay. Um, it's not a radio. It's not a radio mic by any means. It's a vocals mic. But but yeah, they're 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 unidirectional because a lot of a lot of people do sing like this. I I call it church singing, where the people hold the microphone really vertical, and oh. they kind of sing over the top of the diaphragm right. instead of down into the diaphragm. Right. But it's really hard to control the sound. Anyway. Okay. Enough of that. Um, are you ready? Sure. And so we just stopped talking. Because now that we're ready, we're like, okay, what do we talk about? Wait, is this recorded? 
<laughs> it's been recording the whole time. I wow. record everything. Okay. <clears throat> well, I can tell you that early part was nothing. No, no, there's <laughs> nothing there. No, I'm going to clip. I'm all clip it all. Okay, so imagine I've listened to your podcast, and yeah. imagine I'm imagining right now is as this recording is kicking off, you know, that whole intro that you have with the whole uh, uh, electric guitar. Oh, the music? The, the music, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that is just going off right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that really cool lead-in music because, ladies and gentlemen, now please welcome Edmund Wong. Ha, ha, ha. Right? <clears throat> so I've known you a long time. Yeah. I, I, I kept saying or telling people that my feeling is that it's either 8 plus or 10 years. Yeah, it's 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 eight plus. I mean, it's not ten. We we met each other in um, two thousand eight. Okay, so You're a lot more uh, vivid in that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For whatever reason, I don't know how I remember those things, but yeah, I remember two thousand eight, and then we knew each other about a year, and that's when all the other sort of business things started happening. About a year later, yeah. So we just knew each other sort of on the fringes. Um, it's funny because I know you can tell a story and I hope you do because I don't, neither of us remembers. No, no, it, that, that's it. That, that's the whole thing that we don't remember. But the only thing we do remember is how, how it just even came about. Yeah. A phone call, you know. Uh, that, I just, don't, that I don't remember making. No, no, you did. Because, I know, but I don't remember. Obviously, I ended up uh, taking your call and you said, hey, let's get together. Uh, somehow, you know, you have my card. Yeah, and I go okay, and we were in Bellevue. You were in Bellevue. Yeah. You had your insurance uh, agency, and so the only thing I remember was you know driving up to your office, went to your office, and saw you. I think for the first time, maybe. Yeah, and I don't know how you got my card. So then we ended up, you know, just get to know each other. But the weirdest thing is, I don't know how it came out. Like I said, this whole thing is you don't know, I don't know. No, <laughs> it's it's definitely divine. I don't I. It's funny. I don't remember calling you. Obviously, I did, or you mm-hmm. wouldn't have shown up at my office. It was, you know, it wasn't not a weird sort of, you mm-hmm. know, accidental magic thing. I mean, you know, I, I made a call, but what I don't recall at all is as where I got your business card. I don't remember. I don't yeah. even kind of remember if somebody gave it to me. If I found it at a Starbucks. I mean, seriously, I don't remember. Hopefully, you didn't pick it up in the trash bin or something. You know how people <laughs> do things these days. Well, you know, you know, it's funny. I. I don't know if I told you this, but um, I met a really cool guy um, with um, an athlete's outreach uh, company um, by finding his business card on the bathroom floor oh. in uh, downtown Seattle. I mean, seriously, I just Somebody saw a card and, it, I, yeah. and I flipped it over. I mean, I don't know. Actually, I walked by it. So it was on the bathroom floor. Did I tell you this story? Mm-mm. So I was at his deal with George Tolls. Yeah. And I was I was using the restroom before I was driving home and I started to walk out and I saw a business card on the floor and I just, you know, it's a, it's on the bathroom floor. You're not going to touch that, especially a public restroom. Right. Yeah. And I walk out and something in me told me to turn around and go grab that business card. It just like, you know, like maybe OCD, maybe God, I don't know, but something told me and I went back around and I, I grabbed a little towel, you know, and picked up the business card. And um, it was Nikita Motorin. And Mm. I don't know if you've met him, um, but he works with, um, I can't remember what it's called all of a sudden, Athletes Outreach, Athletes International, something like that, which is a um, a nonprofit that um, helps um, college athletes. Mm. Um, It's basically, it's like a church... Uh, I don't know, like a, a youth group, mission group. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, Nikita's going to hear this and just come and punch me in the face. <laughs> but it's so a, obviously it's you're a, connected with him. But it's an outreach for okay. yeah, for athletes, um, and it's international. Wow. Yeah, it's like Young Life except for college level, mm-hmm. you know, and for athletes. And wow. um, I, I've I've met with him a few times. I really like him. But, um, yeah, we haven't done anything together yet, but um, it's my hope that we will. So, so Edmund um, um, has what I call a morning throat, um, which happens to me, too, which you find yourself going <clears throat> a lot in the morning. 
Well, you just have to pick the morning to do this interview. <laughs> okay. No, just kidding. It's my fault. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, you know, the thing is, is people don't know, of course, because they're not with us at this moment, but it's one of those weird Northwest Seattle, yeah. Seattle cloudy mornings. It's supposed to be almost 80 today, and it's like 51 out right now, and it's really dismal. Mm-hmm. It, it'll, it'll hopefully, you know, probably burn off in the afternoon, but, but you know, it just kind of reminds us the time that we're in. Yeah, you know, like, okay, yeah, transitioning. You, you you enjoy your summer. You don't want to let it go. At the same time, you have to face the fact that hey, you know, s- summer is is gonna is gonna say bye bye. And, yeah, and you have to change up your activity, how you you know do things. Yeah, coming this, fall. This is my favorite time of the year, but that's if I had a fireplace. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and because I don't have a fireplace, this is the worst time of year, right? Like to me, there's a uh, how I grew up. There's a sort of romantic thing that happens um, with fireplaces. Um, excuse me, this time of year and the smells in the air, right? The burning, uh, the fire smell and the, the the leaves and everything kind of dying. Mm-hmm. It's just I don't know. It's romantic because it reminds me of the holidays. Mm. You know, yeah, family. And, yeah, you know, yeah. just relationship. Yeah. Everybody get together. Yeah, and this year is going to be obviously a lot different than that because yeah. my father passed away and and. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not worried about that, mm. but I do worry about my mom, mm. you know, kind of being alone, yeah. you know, and so we're going to have to kind of do a little extra, you know, Absolutely. not that so, that's a bad thing. It's a good thing. Yeah. It's, it's sort of a passing on the baton and, and now you're, you know, uh, the patriarch, the, the patriarch, yeah, the I, son, I the it's son totally to carry weird. on the culture, the, the it's, tradition. It's totally weird. I was watching, um, um, Saving Private Ryan the other day. And um, I really enjoyed that movie. It's not one of my favorites ever or anything like that, but it's a it's a really good movie, and it's on Netflix right now. And um, you know, I know how how it goes. I know how it ends. You know mm. what I mean. And for whatever reason, though, um, when they got to the ending, I just started thinking about my dad. Mm. You know, and it, you know, my dad didn't serve in World War II. I mean, my dad served in the army, mm-hmm. but. Man, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I'm sitting there in my bedroom. I'm just crying and crying and crying and crying and crying. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, I was just saying out loud, I don't want to be the patriarch. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be the pa- I just want my dad back. You mm-hmm. know, like I just give anything to have my dad back. Mm-hmm. It really sucks. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so funny because I'm, I'm, I would like to think I'm pretty good with it now. With uh, the other day, um, I was, gosh, where was I? I don't know. It doesn't matter. But I was, I was with my friends. Oh, I was downtown um, at the RSI meeting, and um, you know, it was I don't know two o'clock. It was at the end of the meeting, and uh, I saw. I opened up my binder, and I saw inside the binder some um, a little card that had um, information about my dad on it. Mm. And wow. And then, I, and so at that moment, I went, "Oh yeah, my dad died." Mm. But but here's what's cool about this, Edmund, is for the first time in over a month, I didn't think about my dad when I woke up. Mm-hmm. In other words, it took me until two. I was had to be reminded that, oh yeah, my father passed away. And so that's, I'd say, you know, in some ways I felt guilty about it. But in some ways, thank goodness, because I, I didn't want to, I, I mean, you know, I want to get over it. I want to I wanna yeah. mourn and be done with it and and only, you know, think of dad when with the good things, not mm-hmm. not you know, equate his name with pain. Right, right. <laughs> it's a terrible thing. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, for a lot of us, um, you know, as far as I could remember, my, my only dad uh, was my stepdad. And we always have, you know, all these uh, struggles in the family. You know, we got seven kids, just yeah. different, you know, marriages that my mom and and my stepdad and his uh, uh, uh you know, wife had and so forth. So, so we're all one big family. And it's so funny that, you know, we grew up struggling, right? Um, for attention, for, you know, who's who's and, and whatnot. But uh, the year when he passed away, uh, it just rips me apart. Yeah. And the funny thing was, I wasn't even close to him. <clears throat> uh, but him passing away just made me realize how much even though we're not close, he's still my only dad that I have growing yeah. up, yeah. you know? So, uh, yeah, I could imagine, you know, your relationship with your dad is pretty close. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've heard that 
interview, or I shouldn't say interview, the recording I did about my dad, the memories of my father. Mm -hmm. But I, um, you know, it's so funny. The answer is, is no. Mm. And that's what makes me sad. I was close to my dad. Don't Mm -hmm. get me wrong. But did I spend a lot of time with my dad? And the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And it's it's partially because he worked so much. Mm -hmm. And then when he was home more than... When he was home as much as I probably would have liked to have been home when I was, say, 10, 15, whatever years old, um, I had joined the Navy and then I moved, you know, I was on the other side of the country and then I was doing music stuff and I was, you know, I was just busy with life. And so I'd never had a chance to really be close to my dad in a way, say, you are with your son where you see him every day and you spend time with him every day. My, my dad worked until eight o'clock at night and, you know, I saw him at dinner and that mm-hmm. nobody's talking because he's just shoving food in his mouth because he hasn't eaten all day, mm-hmm. you know? And then we had about an hour at the end of the day from nine to 10 PM. Um, and, um, Families doing what Americans do. We were sitting there on the couch watching TV. Hmm. Yeah, you know, that was our that was our life. So, so let me ask you Isn't this: that crazy? Yeah, it, it, you know the. Uh, so, gro- growing up for me is yeah. just like that. Really? Yeah, and, and I thought you know coming to America wait, it was twenty two y- years ago. You have, you have TV in in Asia? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, hang on. I think half the TV production uh, were imported from Asia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you know what it's funny about we ha- we started this podcast and we haven't even said who I'm talking to. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Edmund Wong. Um, no, I'll I'll do an intro. I always record an intro, um, so I'll make sure everybody knows. But uh, this is my good buddy. This is my good buddy, Edmund Wong. Yeah, well, and we're going to ask him that, why his that, name exists and all these other things. <laughs> so, 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 please tell the story about the TV or why it was like your family. Oh, okay. Um, because you know we uh, just kind of a micro family in in Asia where everybody works hard, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody should have something to focus on. If you're not working, you should be studying. Yeah. And if you're playing, kind of that's fine, but limit that because you still have homework to do. You have math mathematics and yeah. uh, you have reading and <laughs> and more math <laughs> and more math and uh so you know um so the only time that the whole family uh so-called wind down is have dinner in front of tv wow we don't have conversations you have dinner you actually ate like in front of you <laughs> yeah just... we, we would just uh, treat the dining table like a buffet where you have items on the table and mm-hmm. you just pick what you need and put it on a bowl and then uh, we all go sit around the sofa and uh, turn on the TV. Wow. Um, uh, we recognize that as we grow up and realize, oh, this is weird. But yeah. we do this every day. So many people do that. So many, okay. So so my thought was uh, on that was uh, that was not my imagination with the Western culture. No. So when I came over here 22 years ago, I was actually looking for that change. Really? Looking for that wholesome sit down. You know, if... if if my family is not here, I, I want to join another family. I want to. I want to eat in in the American Western culture family dining table. I want to be just just sitting there and observe how the kids and you know parents interact and so forth, <clears throat> like the Waltons. <laughs> uh, you know, I ended up. You know, the funny thing is, uh, you know, it may lead, uh, well. It will lead a little bit into uh, my faith a little bit here. Um, because I, I didn't grow up as a Christian family, so I have certain values at that point. Mm-hmm. And so when I came over here... Are those Buddhist values? Uh, sorry? Did you grow up Buddhist? No, nothing. Nothing? Atheist. Okay. It, not, well, Not uh, even Shinto or Buddhism. Okay. No, uh, but let, let me... Um, I guess Shinto would be a Japanese thing anyway. Right. But to be more clear, my mother, she's a Catholic. Oh, okay. And she insists that we all go to Catholic church on Sunday. And I did the whole thing, the whole confirmation, but I, I was never in it. Yeah. So finally, when I'm 16 and up, I decided, okay, now I can make my own decision. I just don't want to go to church. Wow. You know, so I was atheist. Uh, so f- coming back to that value system. Yeah. So when I, somehow, uh, you know, God knows our silent prayers, uh, you know, the things that goes on in our mind and in our heart. And at that time, when I was still in Asia, I was like, this is messed up. 
Nobody wants to talk to each other. Nobody wants to connect. I don't know how to express what's going on. Yeah. I'm just a teenager. That's a huge part of Asian culture too. Yeah, nobody, nobody does communicate. I mean, no. they just keep to themselves. No, and and uh, and our value is being appreciated through results of a hard work. Yeah, right. If you if you work hard, then you're a good person. Uh, you know, if you are uh, because of hard working and and you become successful, great. Now now you're honorable, right? Yeah. So. I'm sure there are other values there too, family values and and whatnot that was supposed to be there. But what I'm really describing 20 years ago was that whole booming in Asia. You know, uh, as you can imagine, right now Asia is very very wealthy. Mm -hmm. But there was a time when Asia was just not giving up. You know, just pushing every sector, industry, uh, uh, on, on manufacturing, technology, whatever we can consume. Uh, do you know that GSM? The technology we use today on our cell phones. That um, let me think for a second. Two thousand, I think nineteen ninety, maybe ninety five. Okay. You know, way back, America starts using GSM, but Asia has been using it for a good ten years. Well, it's like uh, internet, and yeah, I mean, everybody has like one gigabyte downloads in Asia. <laughs> it's you know, it's yeah. managed somehow. Here. That's reversed. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. so bizarre. Yeah, for that, for that, it's kind of reversed. And GSM means like global satellite like management or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the cell technology back yeah. then, right? Yeah, it's more open. Um, but the consumption, just the drive to consume, uh, really push everybody uh, within every layers of the, in the family to, to, to want to work hard. So um, that's the good and the bad to it. That, anyway, coming back to this whole uh, part of me that says, I, I, I want to be, I want to hang out with a, you know, a family in America. I want to, I want to just participate in their relational part where I didn't have, you know, and well, guess what? <laughs> we don't have it either. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I mean, kind of not really. I mean, it depends on where you go, right? It's family. Yeah, Everybody's it's different. Yeah, I'm talking about 1995, 94. That's when you came to the States. Uh, you know, You're yeah, somewhere around there. so old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, all I know is 22 years ago okay. that I came here, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and, and here's the thing. You know where I ended up? I ended up in Pullman, Washington. Wow. I mean, it's a college town. Yeah. Right? And so you do have families like that. Yeah, I was going to say there. So it's, it's it's pretty singular over there. It's very very um, old-fashioned, conservative Americana. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I was like, this is great. Yeah. This is awesome. And, uh, you know, I hung out with several families there. We become good friends. And, you know, and then I became a Christian for the first time, uh, seriously, you know, versus right. just pretending to go to church kind of thing. Right. Um. So yeah, so you know, I really appreciate that value of being able to spend time together and connect. That's the thing. It's not just we're together, but we're spending time. Right. And and, and one thing about you though, you know, I know you do a lot of interviews. Uh Rob, I, I keep uh talking about you this way. You are the only friend I know who is very in tune. Uh, sorry, only guy friend that I know who is in tune emotionally the way you are. Oh, you thanks. know, your whole experience with your dad and so forth uh, really inspires me in that way hmm. to uh, to to really look at you know how many men these days can't express themselves uh, you know verbally or you know fr from the emotion standpoint you know from a relational standpoint yeah and so there's a lot of uh, 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 burden that 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 you know men carries and and, and they carry over, you know in their shoulder in their work and, and everything else so so the way we handle that is to aggression sometimes. Yeah, right. That's so true. Uh, so I think that's that's something to 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 be said. Uh, uh, you know about able to express and and share the thoughts with people and build relationship, build bridges. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Well, thank you. No, you know it's interesting. I um I always felt very unmasculine as a child and as a as a teenager, especially. Um, you know, you're going through puberty and you're, and it wasn't that I was questioning my sexuality or anything like that. That wasn't it. But it was, it was, um, you know, my dad was gone. I mean, he was just gone all the time. He's working so much. And, um, so when a parent was home, it was my mom. Right. And I mean, and I learned to do girl stuff. I learned how to bake. 
<laughs> you know, I'm a really good baker. You ask my wife, I'm a really good baker. It's really bizarre, you know. I'm a, I like to cook. I, I definitely am, in a sense, a homemaker, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I could easily be a Mr. Mom. I could easily, you know, if, um, if uh, my wife and I made that choice to, you know, have her be the quote-unquote breadwinner, right? Mm-hmm. I could stay home and be a house, uh, you know, homemaker. I could, mm-hmm. you know, but but it's not it's not more of my passion is either, right? I mean, I'm good at it, but I don't love it. Yeah, well, you know, it's like, uh, what? Why? Why is it that we can't bake? As if you know, talking about right, baking. like that's a girl. <laughs> like somehow that's a girl thing. I know, I know, but I mean, culturally, mm-hmm. it is definitely seen that um, that's a quote. Unquote, you know, again, I overuse the term quote unquote. Um, it's very much seen as a feminine sort of thing, mm-hmm. um, you know, Holly homemaker or whatever they call it, you sure. know. And and so for years, I mean, I remember, you know, all the bullies, there's always bullies at mm-hmm. every school. Bullies would call me fag and, you mm-hmm. know, and just, you know, give me a hard time, mm-hmm. say, say all these things, derogatory things to me. And for a long time, I really started wondering if maybe there was something wrong with me, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. And, and when I got married, I went through counseling, uh, like I think you should, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you kind of know, at least hear some wisdom from somebody on the outside of your relationship. Hey, this is what you can expect, you know? And, um, the one thing that gentleman said to, uh, my fiance and I was that, um, your man, he said to her, he said, um, he's very, he's very different than most men. Mm. He's very, he actually used the word feminine. He said, he's a very feminine man. And that his mindset, um, you can tell he was raised by a mother. And so he's going to be thinking differently in a marriage than your typical man. Mm-hmm. And I never understood if that was a good thing or a bad thing because he never said. But I guess I should say I appreciate what you say because I know where it comes from from you. I know that what you're insinuating is, is that um, I'm capable of being transparent. Well, the one word that comes to mind is courageous. Oh, geez. Right? Because you a think lot, I'm courageous? Well, well, put it this way. I mean, for a lot of, and I'm referring to men, okay. is uh, that, okay, we prefer to keep it to ourselves, right? Sure. You know, let, let, whatever is a big issue, we make it smaller. If it's a small issue, we make it a non issue. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's how we yeah, that's manage true. our, you know, uh, situation. But to be able to uh, share, just not being afraid of, you know, I think big part of it, talking or sharing is we're afraid of rejection for a lot of people, yeah. right? So I think that's why the word courage comes in, uh, comes to mind. Um, it's not about saying whatever you want to say. You're being respectful, but at yeah. the same time, you realize that, hey, at the end of the day, a relationship is not based on how much money we have, right? Yeah, It's about, you know, us looking at, another person and say, hey, I respect that person. And I realize that every person has a journey to go, yeah. you know, that we're walking in. And so wouldn't it be great? Uh, I think it's important that if we recognize that, we'll just, you know, help each other along the way. You yeah. know? Uh, everyone has their right to make the decisions. We're just here to help, you know. Um, but you're stepping out a lot in yeah. that sense. So I, I think that that's how I see you, yeah. being you know, uh, more, not so much that because you're expressive, you, you, you're like a girl, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, nothing or wrong with that. Or yeah. Or, right, you know, right. people, people tease that people make that it's a wrong thing. And I think that, uh, it's a societal, uh, pressure that people put on themselves and then they put on other people. Yeah. I think, know? I think people, I think bullies at least mm-hmm. make fun of it because they wish they could do it. There you go. Um, that all being said, I would love to be more transparent and bolder. I would, I would love it. But I also know that, again, culturally, mm-hmm. it's for the most part unacceptable to just bear everything. Mm-hmm. I would love to bear everything. There are secrets. I mm-hmm. have secrets um, that I wish I could share. But I know um, maybe someday they'll all come out. I would love to to talk about them actually right now. Like um, a Rob Jones biography. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. But I, but I think, um, yeah, when I was writing that, I realized it was, it was basically catharsis for me. Mm. And, and people don't need to read that. People don't need to go, I mean, maybe at this stage anyway, people don't need to just go, oh, wow, this is a really masturbatory book about Rob Jones and all his problems. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I want, I want, if I'm saying something to me, mm-hmm. if, if I'm saying something that is deemed as bold or courageous, I want it to matter for the people listening. Mm-hmm. It can't just be about me. It can't right. just be about me, you know, sort of uh, confessing sins or something like that, right? But, but but the thing is, is I would love, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I would love to share everything. I just know that um, it wouldn't be fair to the people, because there's always this, another party involved. Sure. It mm-hmm. wouldn't be fair to them because either, whether they have, haven't authorized it or... Um, would be the opposite, terribly uncomfortable that I said something that sort of, if anybody who knew us could put two and two together and go, oh, well, that came from over here, Mm -hmm. right? And my wife, you know, uh, when I met with Garrett Pang about a month ago, I, I talked about, and I'll talk about it again right now, I talk about sex addiction. I struggled Mm -hmm. and do struggle with aspects of that. Mm -hmm. And my wife was really upset with me. In the sharing, or in that I shared that, oh, okay. and 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 I've had people call me up and actually say, "Hey, Rob, I really like your podcast, but dude, I mean, seriously, I've had them go, you know, you just don't need to be um, religious, or mm. you don't seriously, I've had this, really, um, or you don't need to talk about those things because it's you know, it's it's just kind of for you." And I was thinking, well, maybe maybe it is, you know. But the thing is, is you know what? No, I'm just mm-hmm. going to talk about what I'm going to talk about. I mean, if you listen to the podcast that came out this week with Scott Adams, mm-hmm. um, it's not a free-for-all in the sense of, you know, whatever goes, goes. Mm-hmm. But we're talking about stuff, and we talk about some really ugly things. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to censor it. I'm not. That doesn't mean I should walk around swearing and dropping F-bombs everywhere. That's not the point. But... I I'm not gonna I'm not going to stop being me. I'm going to evolve. You know, I'm going to become in a sense better. But part of get, becoming better to me, Edmund, mm-hmm. is getting stuff out. It's you know, I mean, Mark Maron is the most famous podcaster in the world and he's famous for basically putting his entire personal line of life on on the internet. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm necessarily willing to do that yet. But it's not necessarily my calling. So I'm sorry yeah. for all this, but... but I get you. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I don't know anybody perfect at this point except for one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and, he, and he's, not, um, he's not physically standing on the earth anymore. Well, he's right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's right here in this yeah. room. Yeah. 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 You know? We're yeah. talking about Jesus, by the way. <laughs> and I love him because yeah. uh, I, I recognize, you know, every struggle that I have and I... And I agree with, you know, the fact that, you know, you have all those struggles that you have. And you were just talking about, you know, whether you should air it out or not. And people, your yeah. wife getting mad at you, like, what are you talking about all this stuff? Yeah, yeah. Um, they know. Now they know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think as much as we all could be uh, applaud for, the, for that ability to, to so-called share our weaknesses, I think there's no... There's no completeness to that sharing unless we're able to also share the testimony of the victory, yeah. right? And and again, victory is not a event in time, you know, just like, oh, yep, I overcame that thing and that was that one time. But, you know, I always say this, my relationship with God expires, uh, or let me say this, my commitment and my relationship with God, you know, expires every day and I start new again. Uh-huh. Because no matter how much... I did well yesterday, I still have to follow him. I still have to learn how to love him. You know, I'm married for 20, uh, 20 years now. Hmm. Really? This is your 20th anniversary? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're going to cut this out. Cut no, this I'm out. Not, I am so not going to. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to email Jeannie and I'm going to. She's going gonna... to. So, so everyone has their wife uh, chewing on, on on them for what they say. Yeah, so this is yeah. mine. Oh, good, good. Okay. I can't wait for you to get in trouble. Yeah. No. She's so, going to get mad at me for getting it out exactly, of you. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. Um, but the thing is, um, what I'm getting to that point is that Relationship, you can't just. Uh, oh, okay. Here, here's one funny story. This is uh, year one or maybe year two, uh, two years worth. When I got married with her, um, you know, she would come to me every day, every day. Hey, honey, and coming home from work and all that. I love you. I love. She would tell me every day, I love you. And then she'll be waiting for me to reciprocate, to oh, say right. it, right, to right, say right. it. I love you too, honey. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we did that. And, and then after a while, I go, okay, yeah. 
And then she said, "How come you don't say I love you anymore?" Right? She she wants to hear it. Right. And I'm trying to go like, okay, well, you know, I'm I'm thinking through. Is 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 it more important to say it or that I actually love you? You like know, a, that, it's a love language thing. Right. For her, yeah. Right? So so then one day the stupid me go. I raise my hand with the ring and it. it says, "Don't you see this? I'm wearing the ring, so that means I love you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty stupid. Yeah, that's a great recipe for marriage, right? Uh, yeah. and, and obviously, you know, great uh, comeback. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just to give myself the excuse not to say it, but but it was so stupid. It was foolish. Yeah. You know, man has a different thinking, right? Now, I think when it comes to relationship, I'm still a student of it, um, and I'm. I'm using my marriage as a way to learn deeper relationship. My wife is great at it, yeah, and it helps me in my relationship with God. It does, because that's why I said, uh, no matter how amazing my relationship with Jesus is yesterday, it starts new again today, starts fresh, starts deeper today. Hopefully, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that's a lot of struggles there, and and I love the fact that you know my wife, she she could. Uh, stand toe to toe. Not that she wants, not, not like a competitor, but her understanding, her relationship with with God. You know, uh, uh, you know. I don't like to use the word compatible because we're not comparing, right? But we're equally yoked. Put it that way. Yeah. Uh, so, so that you know, relationship to me is very important because I didn't grow up with a lot of relationship. So now that I love this because this sets us up, right? So how did you get from Malaysia to Pullman? A lot of fighting, a lot of um, ego, right? Um, you know, so because we are all ingrained in our head, you got to have education. Without education, you're nobody. You're, you're a street sweeper. You mean in Asia? In Asia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're going to be a um, restaurant dishwasher, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. that kind of a thought. You're going to get odd jobs, you know, so... Which is true, by the way. In many ways, because they because the if you don't have education, they won't hire you. In a, yeah, especially yeah. in Asia, right? Yeah. Uh, and currencies are so low, and no matter how much you earn, you'll never earn enough. So yeah. you always stay in your family's home, right? Yeah. So a yeah. uh, lot of issues there. So there's pressure, which is pushing. You got to have education, but then here comes a problem. So we studied really hard, uh, as hard as we could, and then there comes a time. Now here in my family that. I have a stepdad, he has his own set of children, and my mom has me and my brother, and in between their marriage, they have two kids, so we have layers and layers of children. Uh, and Layers. Yeah, I call them layers, but they're all family It's now. like a cake of family. <laughs> yeah, there yeah, you yeah. go. So, so, so then there's this favoritism, contention, and all that happen every single day. The arguments between the both of them are always surrounding money, right? Uh, when dad or, you know, my stepdad. But, but you call, call him dad. I call him dad because yeah, yeah. I only have one dad uh, you know, that I know. Um, uh, meaning I spent my entire life with him. Um, so it's always about him taking care of his set of kids first. And then mom is always like, what? You know, right. my kids are important too. And so when it comes time, uh, when time comes to apply for college, and that's the, that's the big question. Well, who's going to fund it? You know, I I personally don't have the money, right? right? I'm living under their their roof, and mom is always fighting, always fighting for making sure her kids get a portion of that. So he was heavily favoring his own children. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that had to suck. Well, <laughs> from, from our perspective, yes, I mean, at that point, I mean, yeah. But but I, let me say this too. Uh, you know, in case my brother, uh, my stepbrother, yeah. uh, is listening, yeah. um, is that you know we now are more of a family than we were before. Yeah. Uh, even though we all live separately, you know, communication is still limited, but we're definitely a lot more of a family than before. Are you the only member of your family outside of the country? Outside uh, of no, the I, my own brother, my blood brother is in New York. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. In I, fact, it's a new thing. I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, my, my half sister is in Vancouver, BC. Okay. My half brother is still in Malaysia. Okay. Right? And soon he'll be here, hopefully. Wow. Uh, and then my step uh, brothers and two sisters, they're back in Malaysia. So seven of us. Wow. Yeah. Um, I guess what I was saying was that whole, the whole push, right? The, how did I end up in, in America? So education was so important that uh, pride comes in. 
Mm. And so I remember one day my uh, my dad was saying, "Aren't you uh, applying for school?" And I was like, "Well, that's pretty cool." They ask. Yeah, I'm applying for school, and then he was uh, somehow, you know, again, I, I'm giving you a picture where we are not having a close relationship, where every sentences, every word that comes out has a meaning but, behind it. Yeah, there's a meaning behind it. it. I wonder why he asked that question, kind mm-hmm. of a thing. And when he said, "So you're applying for school? Well, you should apply a, f- a few more, just in case you didn't get, you know, approved, right?" So it's a word of wisdom. But at that time, I took it like, "Oh, you think I can't get one? I can't right. get approved? Right, right, Is that right. what you're thinking? You know?" <laughs> right, right. Uh, so I didn't apply for many schools. I applied for one. Wow. I just I purposely applied did for the one. Same thing. Yeah, I did the same thing. Because in my mind, I said, if I don't get approved, well, good for you. You don't have to fund me to go to college. That kind of anger, bitterness, right? right? But now here comes the my ego and my stupidity again. Uh, where do I apply? Where do I go? You know, I don't have guidance. Uh, I, I can ask my professors back back in Malaysia. I mean, all that stuff. And here comes the TV again. We're having dinner. I was eating dinner, right? And then advertisement comes on. It was Apple, App, uh, not 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 the company Apple, but Washington Apple, the real <laughs> fruit Apple. Okay. But what drew my attention was. The size of the apple is not the typical size that you and I see here. But right. when we were, you know, whatever they shipped to Asia yeah. back then, yeah. you have to hold it with two hands. Yeah, yeah. The, you you see those. You guys get the giant ones. Why is that? I don't know. It's like it's like that all across Asia. It's like that in Japan too. Okay. Something about like the the hybrids, or they get the they get the <laughs> in the sense they pay for the best ones, or it's, it's yeah. a weird way to market them. Yeah. Yeah. You get giant. I mean, they're monstrous. Monstrous. Apples. Monstrous. Yeah. Two hands, right? Yeah. yeah. You can share one apple with the whole family. <laughs> yeah, but they're also not naturally grown like that. That's right. That's yeah, the that's natural right. apples. You go to an, an apple orchard in Wenatchee or Tenasket, nothing they're, like they're that. in your palm. Yeah, yeah, yep. they're little. Well, that apple, t- uh, you know, caught my attention, and I go, "Where's the apple coming from? Washington? Great, that's where I'm going to apply to Washington State." Now I could have applied to uh, University of Washington, but I didn't know. You know, uh, University of Washington back then, because yeah. I was referring to state, meaning you know, uh, federally funded yeah. and whatnot, and all that, so credited. So I applied for WSU and I got it. You know, and so that was a long story, but uh, came here um, uh, with <laughs> with a big, big chip on the shoulder. Hmm. You know, just like finally I get my break. You know, from from your family. From my family, proof that you know I earned it. You know that whole uh, ungrateful. <laughs> wow, you're walking my dad's path, by yeah. the way. Yeah, in my, what way? That's what my dad did. Um, he was uh, he was a uh, uh, the first child of one brood, and then my grandparents divorced, and then they he re, you know he remarried my uncles and aunts' mother, and mm-hmm. so he has all these half brothers and sisters, mm-hmm. and. Um, he never felt like he fit in. So he, he just, like, these were, kids were favored, and he was the one who wasn't favored. And mm-hmm. so he just said, okay, as soon as I'm out of high school, I'm, I'm gone. Mm-hmm. And he went in the army. Yeah. He just had to get away. He had to become himself. He feel, felt like he had no identity at home. I'm not saying that that's how you no, felt, but but it sounds that's, like that's you, you got it. story. You got it. That's yeah. no identity. I'm, I'm constantly insecure yeah. as a person, yeah. you know, uh, always looking to somebody else that I could you know, model or mimic or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so the direction is let's go west. Let's yeah. go to the Big Apple country. Uh, and, and your brother literally went to the Big Apple. He literally did. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, my my brother and I were were pretty cool in the sense that uh, we grew up sharing a bed together. So we don't have two beds because we didn't have two beds to buy. <laughs> right. <laughs> so wow. we share a bed. <laughs> We grew up uh, hand-me-downs. We share a lot of stuff until we get into teenage, uh, teenager uh, uh, age that we start to go, wait a minute, I need my own clothes. I need my own <laughs> yeah. whatever, right? Is he older or younger? Uh, he's younger. Okay. Uh, Ten months younger. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and as we grew up, we, we found out that we we're kind of opposites. So your birth father was a real rascal, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, he was. He, did, he, did, so but without the sidetrack, do you, do you know him at all? Did you? I met him. That's a whole other story to this. I really kind of want to hear that too. Yeah, if not, you're open to sharing it. Maybe, absolutely, maybe absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, I, this interview uh, is probably going to be about 
all this stuff that goes no, this on. This is important. You know why this is important, Edmund? Because because there's a whole bunch of people out there just like you mm-hmm. who have gone through these things and and they maybe didn't have identity. And what I love about your story is is you found your identity in other things, and you'll and you'll explain that. And I know you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Um, Got, talking about college again. So back in Malaysia, I was doing my, um, you know, the uh, <coughs> pre-freshman, pre-college, you know, college after high school college program, um, and I was away from home because okay. mom just wanted to get rid of us. Because the more we stay at home, there was more argument. Whose kids? Who who gets what? And that kind of yeah. nonsense. So uh, the only plan for her is to get rid of us by kicking us out to college uh, soon, early. Mm-hmm. And so I was in uh, the city Kuala Lumpur uh, in Malaysia, the capital city of Malaysia. And so I went to college all by myself, stayed in the um, uh, room that my mom found when I was uh, taking my uh, assessment test to enter college. While I was taking the test, she found a room. And then once everything's done, she dropped the keys and here you go. There was I was by myself. So ever since then, I've been just a nomad, right? Going from from rental to rental to rental while I was in college. Wow. No, that's okay. What was that? Is that an ice machine or something? Hey, everybody. This is Edmund's Noisy Kitchen. <laughs> that's the... Uh, okay, you can, you, you you can cut no, that part. I can repeat that again. No, no, this is, no. This no is, it's okay. This is life. <laughs> it's okay. I'm not going to cut it. They're going to hear. They're gonna, they're gonna hear you say "cut it," and then I command you, and I'm going to leave it in. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to yeah. annoy you. <laughs> That's the kind of relationship I have with Rob. I command you. Yeah, yeah, um, and I and I ignore you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like about you. Um, so anyway, I, I've been a nomad, right? Uh, just going from rental to rental, and finally, I came to this one particular home. Uh, a single lady, husband passed away, right? And her entire house, you know, Asian ladies, right? Uh, who have a big house with many rooms, she will rent it out to the max. And that's how she gets her income. Right. And so I was... 12 people to a room. <laughs> yes. With a, with a sheet hanging between. Close. Close. Close, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Not quite, but close. Yeah. <laughs> just imagine that for a second. So all we, all we were told is say, hey, you rent a room, so just respect the house. You come home, you go straight to your room, don't hang around. Obviously, there's a lot of people if, if everyone hangs around in the living room. Uh, so, yeah, we're all being respectful to her and so forth. Um, but one day I was coming home and the landlady says, hey, why don't you come join us? I just made some dessert for everyone. So today is like a special day. All the tenants get desserts. Mm. And so I'm like, okay. So I sat at the, at the dining table and she started asking me about who, I, you know, my, my background, me and where I came from and all that. And then asked about my dad and mom. And, and then suddenly you go, whoa, something happened there. Something connected because my mom is actually related to her. Whoa. And then she said, okay, so see that picture hanging on the wall? I said, yeah, that's your late husband, right? Right. Do you know who he is? I said, your late husband. No, that's your uncle. I'm like, what? Come again? She said, that's your uncle. I know your dad. Wow. So that's the first time anyone make any connection for me to my dad because I never knew him. Yeah. Uh, mom and dad was divorced when I was one year old. Right, like the like the person, the, the unspoken person. We don't talk about this person, right? Yeah, at yeah. All. It's yeah. Just... In fact, the only thing I knew about my dad uh, came from my mom, and <laughs> my mom doesn't respect him that much at that point. And your father named you. Yes, yes. Which explains your crazy name. <laughs> my crazy name. Yeah, because you got to tell the story. Okay, so um, Malaysia is governed by the uh, British you know, government a, a while back. And so the name Edmund spells E D M U N D was uh, you know was was highly favored. He wanted that name for me, but he didn't know how to spell because he didn't finish high school. And so he asked the nurse to spell it. So he would say it, and the nurse will spell according how he says it. <laughs> so he came out A D M A N D Edmund <laughs> or Adman or right, whatever right, phonetically right, how right, right, you know. Right, right, right. But these days I respond to a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I try to say Edmund just because, and I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, my mom calls me Edmund the way Edmund's supposed to be. Right, you right, know? right. Um, So anyway, um, that was the first time, and I said I want to meet him. She said, "Okay, I can make that arrangement." Wow. So when I finally met him, I looked straight in his eyes. I was like, "Oh my goodness!" I looked just like him. Wow. I was like, this is scary. You know? Wow. 
And I wasn't a Christian back then. How old were you? Um, 20, turning 21. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I was just like, whew. You son of a... Yeah. <laughs> no, well, not that way. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you were I was just u- like, upset. Well, there's a lot of mixed emotions, right? You know, part of me is like, after all these years, I really wanted a dad. My own dad. Right, right. That I came from his loins. Right, Okay, right, that right. own blood related. Right, highly favored son. Yeah, yeah. And, but another part of me go, you abandoned us. Yeah. You didn't, you have, you, you gone on and do whatever you wanted to but do. But did he really abandon you or is that the story? Because a lot of times it's I the understand. story. Yeah, but that's how I felt. Yeah. That's how I felt. So, so now, uh, then when I came to WSU, uh, age 21, uh, long story short, I got saved. Um, because my struggle, and I knew that somewhere in there, my entire life story, I blame it on God. Hmm. I literally did. When I was going to Catholic Church, I was like, people call you Holy Father. I, I, I don't know. I don't think you're a father. If you are, you're responsible for everything that's happening. Right. And I was just mad. I was just angry. I was angry at Christians too, because I- when be, right before I was uh, leaving to the United States, my, my own good buddy, really good buddy, he has been reaching out to me as a Christian. You know, they use that term, reach out, right? Mm-hmm. Inviting me to church and uh, talk to me about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But every single effort that he make, I counter it. I will attack him. Right. <laughs> or you yawn, one of the two, right? You're no, always upset or... No, no, I, I didn't do that. I just come right at him. Mm. I said, you know what? It's annoying. Why did you keep asking me, inviting me to go to church? All right, fine. Let's talk about it. Mm. So who is God? He said, oh, God is love, you know, da, da, da. Yeah, all, and the, I said, all the pat, safe answers. Yeah, well, that, that's what he knows, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, okay, if God is love, then answer me this. Why is there war in the world? Right, why, right. why are babies in Africa dying with AIDS? And on and on and on, right? And he would just like... Uh, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> he didn't well, know he had I, no. He had no sort of biblical answer or sort of, right? Not yet. At, at that time of his life, he, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I bet he knows now yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because of my... My my, <laughs> gril- <of> my grueling <laughs> because you because, because God yeah, yeah. God has sent me to him to sure. grill <laughs> yeah yeah no I love him I love him um and so it just went on and on and so he couldn't answer those questions and I said there you go I settled my case right uh, but you know the funny thing is he said this Edmund those are good questions and I totally love you because I'm I'm your best friend. We grew up together. I say, I know. I, and I respect you because of that. If you were not my best friend, I would have kicked you out of my door, never invite you because you are, that, you are those Christian. Right, right. Right? Because I'm annoyed door by door it. Door guy. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. annoyed by it. But you're my good friend. I know you. I know your heart. And so I, I said, you know what? Um, I really enjoy the time. I'm going to miss you because I'm leaving now. And then he said this. Where are you going tomorrow? I said, well, I'm, I'm going to U.S. That's not my question. And then I saw a little smirk oh. in his face. That's a comeback. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, whoa, whoa, hang on a second. Where did that come from, right? He had a little smirk. He said, that's not my question. My question is, if you die tomorrow, where will you go? Right, right. I was like, what? He said, will you go to heaven or will you go to hell? And then I said, you know what? I don't even believe in either place. Well, somehow that wasn't my, my answer. I said, okay. I don't think that far. Oh, uh. You know what? Psychologically, that means somewhere deep down inside of me, I needed help somewhere. I wanted to believe there's a heaven and hell. Even at that time, I was angry with God, and that's why I was annoyed by a lot of things that Christians do. Mm -hmm. I was just taking it out on people. I was taking it out on God because of my, my entire growing up experience. And because of that question, oh my goodness, you flew you flew before, right, to Asia? How, how long does it take you to go to Japan? Uh, 11 hours going uh, west. Right? It's a long time. It's a long time. Yeah. Now, here, I'm flying from Malaysia, so you add another six hours yeah, to that. Say, 11... it's, it's, it's almost a day. It's crazy. So my entire flight journey to America, I had a, I had a moment where I couldn't answer this question. Where am I going tomorrow? I know I'm going to WSU. I know I want to do some stuff and da, da, da. Yeah, would I end up in heaven? Oh my goodness! So you had seventeen hours to Seven, this to is contemplate. How you, what you thought about for seventeen hours? I was hours. like, I can't believe he put this thing in my head. Yeah, but I can't run away from it. 
That was the weirdest thing, and that was the transition. That was that whole healing process in the weirdest way. Yeah. And when I landed in America, I was all alone. And the funny thing was, we were talking about here we are in Seattle, Northwest weather. The、yeah. fall, fall has always been significant significant for me because when I ended up in Pullman, here I am, just this. New kid in in America, you know, live his entire life in Asia. Finally, I get to see the the yellowing of the the leaves, and I was like, oh, this this is beautiful.、Oh, I wish all my good friends are with me right now. Yeah, this is the dream. Yeah, you know, I was looking at all that all by myself on campus, and then suddenly I realized all this doesn't happen without a creator.、Hmm. I don't know why I said that, and for that moment in time, I'm not kidding. I heard this voice that says, "But you're looking for me, aren't you?" Wow! And I had to reply with everything that I have and says, "You bet, you bet." Angrily, you bet because you're yeah. responsible. Yeah. You, I put you responsible. If you're talking to me right now, I'm putting you responsible. And God says,、um, "You think I'm not fair? Absolutely, you're unfair. You know, it's just like a." A dad talking to a kid who's just, you know, just gone off the rail, and and I'm so glad that was the moment I had. Wow, that's the moment I had. Even then, I knew there was a connection there, and I still fight. Habits, habits have its way. Yeah, I still fight.、Um, so, but、um, but by that year, at the end of that fall,、uh, when school start, I gave my life to Christ with one 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 condition. Hmm. That I don't want religion.、Hmm. I just refuse to have religion because religion I can read it up on books. I could,、uh, yeah, so called attend whatever synagogues or temples or whatever that that religion has for us. I'm just not interested. I'm interested if there is a living God. I, I just want that. And so、uh, I was、uh, blessed in the way that、uh, I was able to meet genuine, you know, Christians. Um, uh, that was able to help me through, you know, understanding the Bible the way it should understood to be understood. And so it took a while, but I remember one time a friend of mine was、uh, asking me, "Hey, are you going to join that church?" I said, "Well, I'm thinking about it," you know. And he said, "Well, if you join that church, they want you to take that Bible study that that thing called Foundation Bible Study." I said, "Yeah, it might be good for me." You know,、mm. suddenly everything in me just softened out. Yeah, you were opening up. Your heart was softening. Yeah, because I said, you know what? If I'm going to learn about God, I'm going to learn it from a way that that I knew nothing. I don't want to have a preconceived ideas and mix it up with you know new things. I just want to learn it like I've never knew God.、Hmm. And that was my moment. That was my moment, and I really appreciate. I didn't. I didn't want religion all along. As I was even going through Bible study, I was very. You know,、uh, conscious about what is religion. You know, when people say you can't do this, I say, yeah. Where, where is it in the Bible? Right, right. I despise that too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But but I give myself、uh, no reason to stop there. I actually look it up in the Bible and meditate on it, and that's how I I start you know、uh, growing in my relationship with God. And but more importantly, it's really that you know people talk about Holy Spirit, right? But what is the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit is the the mind and the heart of God. Um, that resides in us, you know that relationship. So I wanted that so much.、Um, so the more I,、um, you know, in that process of trans- transformation. So here's what happened: my heart towards my family was softened too.、Hmm. You know, towards my dad. By the way, my dad's name is William. You know,、uh, uh, is that his birth name? Yeah, I, yeah, it's in his、uh, birth certificate. Yeah. Wow. So. Um, that's the dad that I said, you know, left us, and、right. you know, so I suddenly have this new passion for him, you know.、Uh, but before that, also for my stepdad, I have a new passion for him too. I wanted to, you know, share the love of Christ with him. I wanted to thank him. I wanted to tell, and I wrote a long letter to tell him how much I appreciated him, of all the pain I gave him. I apologize. I'm so sorry that I was, you know, just ungrateful, but I. You know, I really want to thank him. I I want to tell him that I'm a changed person. It's a miracle. I know that it it seems imp- you are a changed person. Yeah, I am. You know,、uh, I want to connect with him. You know, at a distance because I was still in college, 
and I was looking forward to go back to Malaysia. And unfortunately, you know, things has its way. You know, sometimes it's too late. So that year, I wanted to go back, but he had a heart attack and he passed away, and that's why it ripped me apart because I loved him so much. Wow. You know, I couldn't get to him. You know, and uh, I learned my lesson as a person who who lives with bitterness. Uh, you know, I wasted my opportunity to connect with somebody that I could have uh, changed the relationship by learning how to love. You know. Yeah. And so, same thing with my dad. Uh, another story there. So I, I purposely found find him. And every year when I go back to Malaysia, I would I would call him up and say, "Hey, you want to have dinner? You want you want to come out? Yeah, yeah, let's meet." And so he was like, at first going, "Well, what's your agenda?" You know, it's like the dad who goes, "You know, right, right. I'm guilty here." And are you coming back to ask for money or? <laughs> right, 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 right. You right. know, all those years now, that I now you want to be my son, <laughs> right? And, and 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 I didn't have any agenda except I want to know him. Whatever I knew about him before, again, I I I don't care. Yeah. And so there was this one time he took us out to this uh, uh, place in in um, in our hometown, and it was a place that he hangs out for seafood. And so he took me to one of the best places to have seafood, right? Mm. And so here I brought Jeannie, and I brought Jaden, and he's meeting them for the first time. I said, "This is my wife, and this is your grandson," right? Wow. And he was like, "Whoa, oh, it's doing it again." Uh, no, that's the fridge. Oh, something. Okay. Yeah. All these ice machines. It's it's here. echoing. <laughs> what are you doing? It's echoing in our chamber. <laughs> um, okay, anyway, so he's meeting Jaden and Jeannie for the first time. Yeah, meeting for the first time. And, and and I can see him. I'm looking at him as an Asian man who goes, you know, his mind is processing. His heart is fluttering. He doesn't know what to do. <laughs> right. So anyway, we had dinner. And uh, at the end, uh, when it comes, you know, when time comes to pay the bill, so the, the owner came out and put his hand around him. And I realized they are buddies too. And so he said, hey, I haven't seen you for a while. And who are these friends? Friends. Friends, right? Who are these friends? And he, pa- he didn't know what to say. Uh-huh. Immediately I caught that and I quickly scoot over to right by his side and put my, around, my arm around him. And I said, I'm his son with a beaming smile. I'm his son. He's my father. And the guy was like, whoa. I didn't know you had any kids. <laughs> yeah. I can tell. I was like, uh, wait, the last time I saw his son wasn't you, <laughs> right? Yeah. Wow. Um, but I immediately tears just roll out his eyes. Wow. It was the most amazing. That's awesome. Amazing spiritual connection. So I still pray for him. Uh, he's still alive. He's still alive. He's still alive. I text him from time to time. WhatsApp. You know, these days we use WhatsApp. Uh, uh, so do you own stock in WhatsApp? <laughs> no, <laughs> your promo I do not I believe. Use WhatsApp, just you know, just WhatsApp. I just, I just make sure. <laughs> At the end, you're gonna have this uh, quick disclaimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Know, no endorsement. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, no, I, th- I think that was just a reference to how how we use so much technology these days. Yeah, yeah. There's so many ways to do it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, coming back to this is that uh, it was amazing. It was amazing, and and I have a journey. I have a journey that uh, I don't want to be a victim, right? As much as my dad, my both my dads may have failed in so many different ways. Uh, so, so Jeannie and I, uh, actually both of us came from a divorce, broken family. Her family had the same situation. Uh, divorce happens and all that. But because our relationship with God has healed us, um, again, not religion, a relationship with God, and we both are committed to a godly, you know, you know, relationship together. Now, it's not easy. I will tell you this: it's not easy. It's not like, oh yeah, Jesus, I accept you, and everything is hunky dory. Right. It wasn't. It was because we trust in God that we were able to go through the valleys of the shadow of death. Right. Uh, the key is that we're committed, committed to go through, not camp and stay and die there. Right. Know? Right. I think right, a lot right. of people just die out in the valley of shadow of death. Um, but we thank God for, for bringing us through. And so, so we're committed in that way in our marriage. Um, and so we wanted to, um, re- keep reaching our families, you know, that even though they didn't, they weren't successful in, in what they had, but it doesn't mean we stopped there. Yeah. Uh, so that's our journey. So, you know, we continue to want to reach out to our families and I'm glad that Jeannie's mom is here in the country. Yeah. Um, she comes to church, you know, with us. That's great. Um, 
my mom, she's in the process of migration. Wow. You know? uh, just keep praying for her. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, long journey. We're, we're uh, citizens now after all these years. Uh, yeah. there, were, there were times uh, in our life for both me and Jeannie, we were like, we don't know if we're going to stay here. You know, are we supposed to buy a house? Are we supposed to continue a career? I mean, how? We don't have a green card. We have a visa that may expire uh, in the next 12 months. Right. And then, you know, here comes 12 months, and then we thought it's expiring, and then there's another renewal, but it only gives us another 12 months, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're just going on a, you know, like a, like a leasing, a visa right. on a lease. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, contract. So, but all along, we've just been uh, believing that, you know, God has his best for us. And, and that we're open to it. We're open to no matter how bleak or risky it may look, but we just know that God has his best. Um, so, yeah, that's been our journey uh, when it comes to our family, how, you know, we were just so angry with each other, yeah. constantly fighting to now, you know, it's like a second half of the game. The first half of the football game was, was ugly, but the second half is paved with, you know, hopefulness, paved with a lot of... Um, peace and forgiveness uh so that's that's been an awesome awesome journey do you think point. you wake up pretty peaceful i mean do you wake up with yeah. hope every day yeah you know as much as we still get pushbacks right doesn't mean suddenly now all our families like oh wow you know we really love the jesus that you have you know i'm still reaching out to my youngest brother you know i think he has a huge dose of the same that i went through that we didn't like religion Right? We didn't like the people who keep talking and talking and talking. And then right. on the other flip side, we see a lot of issues with their behavior, their, the way they live. And so we see a lot of hypocrisy. Um, you know, again, understand that no one's perfect, but he just uh, struggled with it. Right? Now, now yeah. it just muddled his idea about you know, if, they're, if, they're, if God even exists. Yeah. You know, so still reaching out to him. Uh, he and I, probably in, among all the siblings, are the closest. The funny thing about us is that, you know, two guys, we're 12 years separated. We have absolutely minimal conversation, but we're most connected wow. <laughs> in the entire family. Wow. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe because I grew up uh, spending a little bit more time with him. Uh, you know, he likes Nintendo 64 back then, and I was the only one that would play all night with him, you know, and... Uh, Always, you know, uh, yeah, I, I have no, I have no, uh, you know, it's not like the big brother always come down on him, like with advices. Right. I don't have a lot in that way, direction with him, except that, you know, I just, I just encourage him and just believe that, you know, he, 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 he is on his own, that he can make, make good decisions too. Yeah. You know, and I see his struggle. So yeah. I empathize the struggle. And he's, so he's in his early thirties now. No, no. Uh, 20, uh, late twenties, maybe. Mid, really? mid to late 20s, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Boy, you know what? You catch me in the morning. My math is just... I know. I was like, you're, you're Asian. You're supposed to know this stuff. <laughs> I know. <laughs> with all the distraction that goes on Come with on, the, man. With the coffee. Yeah, yeah, 30, 30. Yeah, you're right, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. Um, He's my little brother, so I always right. keep him in my, in my head as yeah. the 20s. Yeah, because I knew you were in your early 40s. Yeah. Um, Tell us the uh, miracle story. Which one? Uh, your son. Okay, I love I love this story, and so I, if you don't mind, no, I not love, at all. I, I love, love to share this story yeah. with the world. Yeah, I, I love that because it's not my doing. Uh, I love sharing that because the graciousness of God. Jeannie and I, when we were married, um, the first seven years we struggle to have kids, to have any kid. Um, now the funny thing is, back in the time when we were in our in our career, we had one of the best medical plans in America. We literally could just pick and choose what we want to, you know, who we can go to and what procedures we want to take. So we tried all kinds of uh, help that we can get to get uh, the pregnancy going. Nothing happened. But in that process, though, it was very stressful, mm -hmm. absolute stress. Um, it, it, it just breaks down our relationship, and, and we were struggling. There were times we were contemplating divorce. Right, that's how bad it was, um, and then um, so we tried everything, and finally that's it. We're, we're just shoulders just dropped and hopelessness. Mm. And here we are. We're going to church, and there was this one preacher from uh, Malaysia, and he is known as a prophet. Mm. Now, you can imagine we have our own thing going on, going to church, 
how open are we to listen to? Like, like we're beaming with joy and smile yeah, yeah. and raise hand, hallelujah, <laughs> praise Jesus. No, we're not. We're just like, yeah, yeah. We're down for the count. Yeah, yeah. you know, we're we're just we just need help. Yeah. So at the end of his sermon, he point us out. Okay. We don't know him from Adam, so to say yeah. <laughs> using that phrase, but he somehow he knew us spiritually. He pointed us out, and the first thing he was saying, he, he, he didn't want it to fluff it out. He just wanted to go direct. He said, you need to repent. At first, in my head, I go, that was an easy one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody does, because you don't trust in God that he would give you a son. I was like, whoa, that's specific. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's very, very uh, straight into the heart of what our the concerns matters. are, our, yeah. our frustrations. Yeah, yeah. He said, same time next year, you will have a son. Wow. And, and you're like, true. well, who do you think you are, Benny Hinn? <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I Sorry, I, Benny Hinn fans. <laughs> <laughs> well, his name is uh, Pastor Benedict Rajan. Oh, wow. It's yeah. Not far off. Not far, yeah. Benedict Rajan. Yeah, yeah. Or Ben. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Uh, yeah. Pastor Ben. Um, and I, I respected the fact that... Uh, you know, he was a very humble man. He has his own story. You know, very humble man who loves the Lord, who uh, despite of all the odds that people told him that he should just quit his pastoral right. effort right? because he can't preach. <laughs> wow. He can't uh, do the things that most, you know, seminary trained him up to do. Mm -hmm. But he would spend time at the altar of God. No money. He has a motorbike. Those are... 80cc motorbike, really small ones that you can find in Asia. Yeah. N no money for gas, but he would go anywhere the Lord sends him. Huh. You know, and anyway, that's his background, and, and I really respect him for that. But what God wanted to do through him, that was that miracle. And true enough, same time next year, Jaden was born. And the reason why his name is Jaden, because uh, the story that we have was related to somebody in the Bible, Hannah, uh, mother of uh, Samuel, mm -hmm. that she couldn't give birth. But God heard her prayer. So the name Jaden means God heard. Oh, okay. You know, our struggle, God heard our cry, God heard our prayer. And I think it was a good lesson for us is never give up on God. Yeah. You know, miracles are miracles, but the what it established, I think... You know, with that kind of principle, it applies in many, many situations. You know, uh, I don't have a W-2. I, I, I own my own business, right? I'm a consultant. There are times that uh, revenue comes in. There are times revenue doesn't. That's the, that's the risk of doing business, right? Um, and at times when you go out, you go, oh, oh, what happened? You don't see, you know, resources coming in or whatever that is. We tend to be affected by what we see in our eyes, feel with our emotion. Yeah. But something about faith, something about trust keeps you anchored. And, and I've learned to, to rely on that yeah. versus my emotion, what my eyes see and so forth. Um, so anyway, a little, a little bit of everything yeah. uh, in, in regards to that miracle. And uh, Jaden has ever since, you know, the funny thing about uh, the first year when he was born I dedicated, you know, Jeannie and I dedicated him to God in saying this, God, this is not our child. This is your child. Mm -hmm. But you have entrusted us to become the earthly parents of your child. And so every night when I pray, you know, I say, God, would you teach me how to be a father just like you? You are Jaden's father. Teach me how to be a father like you to Jaden. Teach me how to lead him. Teach me how to, you know, raise him up the way you, you, you desire to, Yeah, you know. Um, so, you know, Jeannie and I, we are both pastors, uh, of a small home church and growing, you know, just watching Jaden grow up. The one thing we don't want to have him label as a PK, you got, you know, yeah, what is a yeah, PK? Pastor's kid. Right. So I, I, I explained it to him. I said, even though your parents are pastors, doesn't mean you have to live like a PK. Yeah. You need to grow up and have your own decisions about Jesus Christ. Yeah. And we hope our examples, the teaching, everything would draw you towards that direction that you can make your own decision. Yeah. We never want him to be forced just because, you know, you better be a Christian. Otherwise, 
you know, uh, uh, put a shame to this uh, whole family ministry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and I'm enjoying it. So, you know, he, he's 12, turning 12 this year. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. He uh, loves football. And he, you know, I told him, I said, hey, I teach him everything I, I, I know how at this point. Um, uh, as a financial advisor, I, I, I teach him good financial health. Uh, he has good financial, you know, uh, cleanliness, so to say. Uh, very generous. Planted at, good seeds in his head. Yeah, yeah. He's generous uh, in some form. At the, in, in some form, he is very uh, businesslike. Yeah. And, and some to a point, I'm scared by that. <laughs> like, whoa, he yeah. is. He's he's watching every details of the process. You know, he has his own. Uh, last year, we were uh, we were going. We went to Haiti, and we said we're going to raise fund. And on his own, he raised funds, and he bought. 20 goats Whoa. for 10 families in Haiti. Wow. All on his own. You know, he did the duct tape wallets and he woke he woke up at 6 a.m. and sit at the desk and make wallets so wow. that he could raise funds. And then at by 8 o'clock, he would go to school. Wow. Right? He would bring a whole um, container of the wallets that he make and then he would sell them. Wow. You know, and he'll come home, uh, you know, do do the family thing, dinner and all that, long enough to go back to the desk and make wallets. He was dedicated. Wow. I, was I, like, did, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. I was so proud of him. And uh, this year he wants to do it again because we're we're planning to go to Haiti again next year. Wow. Um, but just... I've, I've said wow a lot. I realized I'm like, wow. Well, me wow, too. Wow, yeah. Wow, every, wow. Everything you said, I was like, whoa. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, everybody. You're like, just like, dude, just be quiet. <laughs> I well, didn't know. I knew you went to Haiti. You know, like mm-hmm. all, all the Facebook posts, and you know, we had conversations before and after. But I didn't know he he did that. So, and and on his own volition. I mean, he on, made on those own, choices. He made his own choices. That's that's the that's the whole point to this. Even when he grow when, when he gr- grows up, I want him to be making his own decision about his relationship with God on his own. Yeah, accord. Um, I I think that's the most important. Uh, you know, part of anyone who's even contemplating about, you know, God or anything spiritual in that sense. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's the miracle child that we have. Uh, every year I get to share his story. Um, and every year I know that um, we're still in a journey. He's, he's imperfect. I'm imperfect, you know, uh, but we're growing together. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, you, you, said, um, you said you were a pastor and you mentioned being a a financial advisor. What I, I know, of course, I know you're both. Um, if you were to give yourself one description as a as a, um, this is my job. A dual dual purpose right. guy. What, what do you what what do you you know what what do you consider yourself first and foremost? I mean, a, just a father, or do you consider yourself a pastor? Do you consider yourself an investment advisor? What, what do you what do you call yourself? I, I would consider father first. Father as the center of all of that. Because a good pastor should always be a good father. Yeah. Because I see a lot of pastors who doesn't understand or don't have the heart of fathering. Boy, it's a brutal ministry. Yeah. You know, um, at the same time, you know, I, I respect a lot of courage for a lot of people who are learning to be, you know, leaders and, 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 and take on the role as a pastor. But I also want to say that, you know, consider the, the relationship with with God themselves, right? You can't lead, you can't give what you don't have, right? Right. So I think father fathering is very important in all aspects. Um, uh, another word I will also use to describe, you know, my situation in all these roles is I'm a tent maker. It's a biblical term. Talks about Apostle Paul, where he would travel all over the the the, the cities and countries um, to preach God's word while he make tent and sell tents to support his journey. Right, so I'm that way. My wife and I we're both tent makers. We both work. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, whatever we we make, we tithe. We actually, you know, do the charity ourselves too. Right. Um, so none of us takes a salary. Uh, for that reason, um, we're really blessed. We're we we operate in the you know in uh, faith. In faith, yeah. uh, the church has absolute minimal cost of operation. So then we were able to give away, you know, and help other people. Um, so yeah, that's that's who we are. Yeah. So as an advisor, when I go out there, I always meet with business owners and 
And in the back of my head, every time when I engage and get to learn about them, I learn about their family. I learn about what it is that that makes them want to be a business owner. And often I see that they have struggles too because they're human beings. They have a business to run. They take risks. At the same time, they have a family to balance out, right? Yeah. So uh, I have plenty of opportunities I could share that with them that said, hey, I'm just like you. And what I share with them is, you know, there are uh, values we need to protect. You know, with business, here's the thing. A lot of business owners I work with are, you know, family business. At one point, everybody is backing up that idea up to a time when once the business gets really big, if they're not careful, they're now all slave to that machine, right? And so um, I had the opportunity as an advisor to just be a human being, be another brother, be a friend, be a father, peer, you know, to sit with them. I have a business owner <laughs> uh, in central Washington, and he said, you know, there was a time when, when he looked at me as the trusted advisor and said, hey, here's 200000 What would you do for me differently? And so, you know, he's looking for, you know, how do I invest the money and so forth. And so he wants a proposal. So, but, uh, okay, so I came up with a proposal to so-called win this bit of money that he has uh, entrusted to me, right, to our firm. And so since then, he always pushed this idea. Okay, here's another so much. What are you going to do differently? Like he's looking for the new thing. Right. This year, though, I realized, okay, you know what? I have built enough trust with him and a relationship with him. And I see his two sons coming up in ranks in the company, learning the business, so forth. And so this year, he started the same thing again. So here's, you know, so much. What are you going to do differently? I said, okay, before I answer your question, I have a question for you. Before you ask me, what can I do for you? Let me ask you this. What have you done for your family lately? He said, huh? <laughs> get out. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. No, no, I know. No, yeah, he didn't, he didn't say get out. He said, uh, what do you mean by that? I said, I said, let me ask you this other question. It looks like your sons are working in your business right now. They're, they're still in the early stage and so forth. If I were to ask your two sons, if they were to do something they're passionate about, do you think they're going to say your business or something else? Mm. He's like, well, I never asked that before. What are the chances they say is something else? Mm. And would you be open to that? He said, yeah. I said, that's my question. Have you considered building a family bank? Mm. Take that 200000 start with a seed. Maybe they have a different passion that you can make an impact as a dad right now. I mean, how much more money do you need? I mean, it's crazy talk, right? How many financial advisors would push away money? I'm not yeah. pushing away money. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually built another component of wealth that most, uh, you know, most traditional financial advising won't, won't be thinking about because it's all about the AUM and portfolios, the, right. the, the rate of return. That's just commodities, right? So, mm. so um, to me, it's just that you know, one father to another father. Uh, that's what I'm most passionate about. Um, I, I, and I love what I do. I love what I do. I don't know how long I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it as long as I can. Yeah. Uh, because of the relationship that I built. That's amazing. So, you, so when you say you don't know how long you're going to do this, do you are you starting to feel compelled to go in a different direction now, or is it? Uh... No, I, I just uh, I live one day at a time. You okay. know, I always believe that uh, I'm always committed 100 percent, even for one day. Yeah. You know. Um, so I'm going to throw something at you. You and I both know Alan Pratt. Mm-hmm. Alan owns Pratt, Amazing gentleman. Pratt yeah. Legacy Advisors in Bellevue, Washington. And um, uh, I had a conversation with him maybe two years ago um, after a business meeting. And and um, I asked him, what does he do? What, what does he think he does that sets him apart? Or what does he do every day? What's his habit that, that he feels he's successful? Or excuse me, that, that helps him remain successful. And he writes down the word die every day. Mm, there you go. There you go. You know what I mean? And a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. Um, because it is very much a you know biblical construct concept. Yeah. You want to explain um, how dying every day helps Edmund Wong? Well, I, could, I, I would imagine uh, perhaps he is also in the same uh, 
by the way, I like to create words for my convenience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe he, uh, you Your know, Asian I want, invention. Yeah, Asian invention. <laughs> uh, I, I want to say the word mindset, but I want to use the word heart set. Oh, nice. There you go. Uh, I, I I can imagine what uh, uh, Alan was referring to is similar to what Paul is saying. Um, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Mm-hmm. You know, Apostle Paul was talking about when he lived, it's such a privilege to be like Christ. Uh, what Christ embodies and represents is that he he reached out to the lost. And knowing that, um, you know, one day we all will die and, and, and judgment does come. You know, we are rewarded according to our deeds. You see, a lot of misunderstanding is that for a lot of people, it's like, well, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me, but I didn't ask for it. Okay, leave me alone. But Jesus didn't come to bother anybody. Mm-hmm. He came to change that perspective and said, but you don't realize what's going to happen. And I love you. And I want to give you an option. It's entirely your choice. But just know that, that he didn't come to mess up our life. Yeah, yeah, He came to change, you know, just like how he changed my life. So, um, you know, to live is Christ. But when we die, it's an absolute gain. Yeah. Because we live to the fullest we can in honoring of, of what God has called us to do. You know, if I were to take my first 20 years of my life and continue now the way it was, I, I don't know what kind of destruction I would have done to so many more people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, so but because of Christ, if I would die today, I would have gained so much more. Uh, so I'm totally in that, in that camp. Um, with Alan Pratt. You know, I, I had several uh, meeting opportunities with him. I, I wish I get to know him better and, and he gets to, you know, we both get to know each other better. But uh, yeah, I look forward to that. You know, I, I think the time that we had together was really short. It was in a business setting. It was in his uh, workshop. I, I, I really can see that he's a man uh, of, a, you know, of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has a Holy Spirit uh, that guides him in his work. Yeah. Uh, with his client. So you've heard me talk about this before, the 97-3 rule, mm-hmm. right? I believe everybody is 97% badass at something. I know you're really, really good at the things you do. And I know um, we're sort of, as people, I mean, everybody, we're limited. We can only do so many things. And we can only choose to do a few things really, really exceptionally well because, right, if we spread ourselves too thin, we're not going to do anything really well. But what doesn't Edmund do well? well? What are you bad at? What are you? What are you? What are you missing? Like, what's the thing that's missing, and what do you need other people to help you with? Yeah, you know, I appreciate that. Uh, I think I remember one of the meetings. I I get to write on the board my my so called weakness. Yeah, and patience. <laughs> patience, yeah. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, patience is also my strength. At the same time, it's my weakness, depending on what I'm dealing with. My absolute weakness is patience, patient with, uh, be- because I'm not good at it. Uh, that's why I have people that helps me. That's why I'm, I would say, come please, please help me doing forms, mm. you know, doing processing, Um there was a time when I started the business. I did everything myself. And I just spent way too much time doing the forms. I'm not saying forms are bad I, and, and, and I'm, I'm so... Or you're above it. Or, I'm above it. No, they're yeah. so important because those are my clients' information. Mm-hmm. It's just that I, 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 I second guess myself when I... Did, did I... Okay, what is this question you know, really you know, referring to? Am I putting in the right information for my client? And then, uh, you know, every, every organization has its own compliance. You know, did I miss it? Um, and so I, I, I take too long because I would double check everything, right? I want it to be perfect because when I turn in the form, I don't want it to come back and say, hey, you missed that. Right. And so I took meticulous time doing all those things. And then when I submit it, I want it processed right away. Right. <laughs> right? So, and hurry up. And hurry yeah, up. Yeah. You know, the whole world is waiting on you, you know. Um, That's great. And so I'm very meticulous. I, in, a, in a sense, I'm a perfectionist yeah. in that sense. Uh, but if in order for me to achieve that, to have the highest quality, I realize I can't do it all by myself. 
So I, I need to hire people to do that, and I appreciate the people I work with. And sometimes, you know, people are people, right? They have their days, and and when things didn't work out the, exactly the same way, I, I've learned now to take a deep breath before I talk to my staff. Yeah, I right? talk to my friends; they're my friends too. Um, I take a deep breath and consider their situation, and then uh, talk to what's more important instead yeah. of the emotion lashing out and saying, "All right, you know what? You dropped the ball." Or right. you need to do this or do that. I just go, okay, what, what do we need to do? Let's focus on the positive. So um, so I'm still learning a lot more uh, as much as, you know, I, I think, yeah, we do have those weaknesses, uh, but I don't want to make it a reason for, for having weaknesses, um, but, but finding solutions. I think working with people is the most uh, joyous thing that anyone can have in this world. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, because you said, patience and um if you don't mind i'll tell a quick story about patience mm-hmm. but uh i have very little <laughs> you <laughs> yeah yeah surprise <laughs> you know um my always my joke has always been lord give me patience and hurry please please <laughs> i will give you more yeah, patience yeah. give me patience and please hurry i want um, it now <laughs> yeah you know i i would like to think that i've developed that skill set and i think there is a skill set involved with patients that it's not just um born or bred in or like sort of god infused but that you actually develop it right through pain um <clears throat> excuse me um i don't remember oh now i know where i was going I, i've discovered this lately so for, over the last year i've spent a lot of time driving mm. tons and tons and tons <laughs> Tons of time driving in the car or a truck, you know, 11, 12 hours a day. I mean, I've worked seven days a week for over a year now, with the exception of Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I think the 4th of July and maybe my birthday, I haven't had a day off. And uh, that's because, I, you know, I'm working my regular day job while I'm building my company, while I'm doing the podcast, all these other things. And um, one of the things I notice with my regular day job is is that I have to be at certain locations at certain times. Manifest deems that, right? Mm-hmm. And um, because I'm, um, it's not so much about being impatient, but because I'm a time-focused person, I love being early, right? Yeah. To me, it's a military thing, right? If you're on time, you're late. You need to be early, and uh, my brain always tells me, okay, I got to be there at 10.15, so I better be there at 10.05, just so I have, you know, space, time, you know, time on the side to get stuff done and uh, gauge for traffic. And then inevitably, Google Maps takes me down a road that puts me five minutes late, no matter what, every time, every time. And the thing that I've discovered through my own development of patience is it's perfect. I've never had an issue with a client who said, why are you late? Ever. Yeah. I, and I've been late many, 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 many times. Not, not I uh, want to, just just traffic, you know. Mm-hmm. The nature, especially at the Puget Sound, the traffic is a nightmare here. Unpredictable. Unpredictable at best. And um, so I've never had an issue. And, and people could say, oh, well, that's just coincidence. And I would tell you that everything in life and again, as a man of faith and as a man, clearly, as anybody who's listening to this podcast or knows me well knows, I am so not religious. I am so, so not a religious person. But but it's perfect. Life is perfect. And everything, when I look back, has always worked out in my favor, just not the way I wanted to or expected it. It's always worked out. And it's been better than I probably could have done it if I had done it myself. So I've discovered that my brain goes, okay, I'm going to be five minutes late. Now, people are going to laugh. I get it. But my brain says, okay, but God must be cool with that. And like, what if I were going five minutes faster? That would increase my chances of a car accident. Mm. Um, Maybe God didn't want me to go down that road because I would have hit a deer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know, and again, I get it. You can say that's coincidence, and maybe it is. Maybe it is. None of us know. But the thing is, is I've discovered that my brain now is programmed um, not by my choice, I'm telling you, because I choose to be there now 
Mm -hmm. It is not by my choice. My brain has been reprogrammed as far as speed and getting there and to say, well, if this is how it's going to be, it must be the right thing. And, you know, the other day I broke down on the the side of North Bend Way for three and a half hours. Mm. And I was really, really frustrated because I had things I, I want to do, things mm-hmm. I have to do, things I need to do for the business, uh, podcast, editing, et cetera, all these other things. And I called the toe and they're like, well, you will have a toe arrive in three hours. You know what I mean? I was mm-hmm. like, oh, man. And so what I did, I sat on the side of the road and made business calls. And people go like, well, yeah, duh, dude, you're just being efficient. And yeah, I was. But the thing is, is I, I wouldn't have done those things. Mm. I would have driven back to the shop. I would have raced over to the coffee shop, stuck my headphones on, edited my podcast, and I wouldn't have made those calls. And mm-hmm. some of those calls ended up being very important. Yeah. And, and thank you. You called me too. Yes. At that time. Yes. I mean, you're just that relational connector. And, you know, that's, that's, that's your gift. I that's love people, buddy. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm glad you shared that because I think for a lot of times, people just take their situation as a doomsday, mm-hmm. and and you know, woe is me, right? I've, Why me, I've God? D- I've done that a lot, though. Yeah, we all do. You know, we all do. Very hard on the sleeve. Um, I mean, it seems like over the last um, few years, I mean, it's been an excuse. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I just just constantly blaming my circumstances yeah Uh, this hasn't worked out for me because x right or look at this or you know if i wake up today i'm in a good mood wake up tomorrow i'm in a bad mood Mm -hmm. and i just make sure everybody in the world knows it right that's my definitely my weakness is my heart of my sleeve yeah yeah well we're growing you know i'm glad that uh you know especially this year so many things happen in your life and and i know i I, i'm not always there for you Um, you are always there for me well, you may not be there in the way you would like to be, right. but you're always there in a way that I need you to be. You, you've you always been there for me. And the fact that we've sort of reconnected after a number of years Crazy. apart. Yeah. And right. and the fact and the way it happened was lovely. So yeah, it, I'm, it's, I'm, it's I'm glad. A, I'm glad. It's been a very, very good thing. Yeah. I, I really think that, you know, God has a path on this. You know, I know that uh, your listeners are, you know, your, your ability to reach out to different people that you interview with. And uh, that's something that, uniquely, you know, belongs to you, right? Um, I can only reach out to certain people that uh, I'm, I'm preview to. And, yeah. uh, but together, you know, uh, I hope that every bit of a life sharing uh, brings hope to other people. Um, yeah. And what happened to you this year was a lot. Yeah. And one thing that encourages me is that you're not, you don't give up. Yeah. You know, so I think it, it in the same way, it's like... A, Iron sharpen iron, you know. Yeah. Um, that what you what you are doing, what what God has us do, um, me and my wife and, and the ministry and the work that we do, um, I, I'm just glad that we have today. You know, uh, I know you've been asking about the this uh, interview, and I and I apologize it took so long. No, uh, it's okay. It's the right timing, right? It's yep, perfect. There it's, you go. It's it's perfect. Yeah. And we got this time. I mean, if we had if we had met last week. It would have been under duress. Right. It would have been much noisier in the background, and we would have had half the time. Yeah, we were we were thinking that we're going to do this interview in the middle of pipe market, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where the flying fish is going on and <laughs> <laughs> the singing. <laughs> not 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 good. Not good. Not good. Um, but no, this has been really nice, and um, you know, I I appreciate your support, and um, you know. You mentioned something um, about what's going on, and you know we're building this. So, so for those of you who, who don't understand yet, really, what the ultimate goal of Rockstar Superhero is, is we're building an institute, and the idea is is to get um, incredible business leaders in a number of different communities around the country and maybe around the world um, to formulate ideas, to work together, to, to do business together, to mentor, to educate, to teach, to love, to support, um, and ultimately to do superhero type things, right? The idea would be that if Edmund and I are doing business together, we're serving each other's business and serving each other's life. But ultimately, um, our goals are to be heroic. Our goals are to be legacy minded, right? To think long term, to do extraordinary things for people because it is always and always will be life is about people. It's about people. And the, when you went to Haiti last year, 
um, I have to admit, I was both, um, well, I was envious that you were there. And also at the same time, I was like, man, it must be hot. <laughs> like it had to be so hot and humid. But I wish I was there. You know, I wish I was there serving and doing a good thing because um, I, 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 I long for that, you know. Well, I, uh, here's the funny thing. Um, it took us two months to prepare as my, our mindset and heart set. <laughs> Here again, yeah, I use that yeah, word. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I did talk to a team of seven um, was I said, first of all, here we are coming from America, going to Haiti, right? We're bringing, uh, goodness, we brought 21 luggages or items with us, just wow. full on carry. And a lot of resources poured into that. And uh, I said, first of all, before we think we are the, oh, we're so fortunate, we're the giver. I want to say this to the team. I said, first of all, a lot of them have something we don't have. So don't think that they are lacking just because we are the giver. Right. So many people sort of go with this elitist attitude that right. look, at, look at us arriving to make your lives better. Right, <laughs> right. So it skews the idea here uh, of, of real, real human, um, amazing human being connection, right? Right. I said, number one, they probably have a lot more joy than we have. Yeah. Right? Because uh, they don't have anything. What do yeah. they have? I mean, when we go there, literally, they have each other. Yeah. They know each other. Yeah. By families, by, you know, they live in villages. In so many ways, we live in cities, but we're so isolated. Yeah. Right? So I prepared the team that way in knowing that such a humble, you know, perspective. And when we go there, it was so true. Yeah. Now, we do empathize they have sicknesses, right? Because they don't have clean water. But when it comes to their human, human relationship, they have each other. Yeah. And I, that was this one thing I want to bring back is to learn from each other, no matter what our economic state you know, is. And so it was great for Jaden to see that because when he went there, all the kids were, you know, it's so funny, in, in Haitian, they see us, they, mo they usually see Americans, Caucasian, okay? Suddenly they see Asians yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, wait, this Chinese guy showing up. Yeah, yeah. So I can, I can hear, Chinua, Chinua, oh, Chinua, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? It's like, they, they say, oh, Chinese, Chinese, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. We're like, oh, okay. Um, and and they, they they are fascinated with Jaden how he how he you know he, he wears you know very simple things, mm -hmm. but they are all sports related. That's all Jaden's right. clothing uh, are like a soccer clothes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they're like, oh wow, they're touching his material, touching his hair, and all that. And Jaden just felt like I want to give more. I said, don't worry, you know, just just remember this, we're we're, we're there to learn, and I want you to to know that this is something that. You understand, you are privileged. We are all privileged. At the same time, we are to be humble. Yeah. By the fact that there are a lot of things they have, most most of us here in America don't have. Yeah. And so we're actually more poor than they are. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> right? It's so, so true. I I, uh, I when I went to Japan in 1998 the first time, um, my girlfriend at the time, my wife now. Um, she knows I love roller coasters, and so she took me to Osaka Expo Land. And while we were standing in line for a roller coaster, all of a sudden I felt a tug on my shirt. And I turn around, and it's a little boy, a little Japanese boy. And he said, hello, how are you? In English. Hmm. And I said, I am fine. What's your name? And then he realized, I asked him a question he didn't know how to answer. Mm -hmm. And then he ran off, and he went over and stood in line behind his mother and they, you know, kind of waved at me and, and everything. And I waved back and I realized this little boy probably had never seen a tall white guy before. I mean, not, or very few mm -hmm. because, you know, Japanese, the Japanese culture is very, you know, it's very homogenized. It's very, you know, everybody looks the same. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but it's true. It mm -hmm. is true. And um, it made me realize that heart of that little boy was just, so pure and just he was curious but he but he wanted to say hello he, he wasn't like hey pointing at the weird geeky tall mm. goofy fat guy over there but the he was interested and curious and wanted me to know i was welcome 
Wow. And that really hit me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't get this in America. Mm. I don't get that simple thing. And, and you know, you, you, you said what you said a second ago. It reminds me that, you know, what do we do nowadays? We're so numb to technology and all the things we have that make our lives better. And they, you know, I was thinking, how do you, how did we used to get around? I mean, if we didn't know how to get somewhere, if we didn't have um, memorized directions in our mind, how were we getting to, you know, Stephen's house in Graham, Washington? Well, it's because he'd tell you to drive four miles out of Puyallup and then look for the white mailbox with the reflector on top, turn left and go 500 meters down the road and it'll be a red barn on the right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was just, that's what you did. Um, kids would be playing out in the fields. What were they doing? They were throwing rocks at at, at uh, hornets' nests. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you know, or yeah. playing simple. with a simple playing yeah. with a boomerang out in the field. I mean, that's what we did. That's what we did, and it was awesome. Yeah, We'd it climb is. Climb trees, um, and and play hide and seek, and build forts, um, and use um ferns as the roofs of the teepees we mm. built and then the next day they the roofs would be gone because the cows would have eaten the teepees and then there'd be <laughs> cow pies everywhere around the teepees <laughs> and the and the point being is is that the world was a different place yeah. it was a different place yeah. and and we long we have romanticism for our past because that world does not exist it does not mm-hmm. and i hope with my three little children and with your young son that they can look back at their childhood and their parents paid attention to them and not the four-inch glowing right. screen in their hand. Right. So they have something because they don't have the world of cow pies and forts. They don't have it mm-hmm. unless they live in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And so, yeah, when you talk about Haiti and you talk about, you know, you think about like in, say, um, not Colombia, but in Brazil with these undiscovered, unreached tribes, tribes yeah. leave them alone, man. Their lives are perfect. They, yeah, don't modernize their life in our perspective. Right, right, right. You know, they've seen you've seen the pictures where they're pointing up at the helicopters and they're terrified. Yeah, because that is you know wow. you know a demon or whatever. Right, they just yeah. have no concept of what that yeah. is. Just leave them alone, man. Yeah, I, I think you know for us, you know, uh, that we don't have to. You know, I, 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 this is not about beating ourselves up because we have all these amenities and modernization. I think it's a real call. Yeah, of, it's nice to have that stuff. It's nice to have those stuff, um, but it's a real call for us to try. You know, try even harder to build relationship, if anything at all. Yep. You know, um, for me, it's just that I know that nothing we have today is owned by us. You know, it's all gonna go go away. Right. Yeah. Um, so I know that. Uh, all of us are privileged, are blessed. You know, God loves us. Um, he does have instructions for us to be successful. You know, success is not always one way. Yeah. Uh, or it's always about money. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's, 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 let's do that. Yeah. Let's and try harder. Any last thing to share with people? Any plugs, companies? You know, you work for Integrity Financial. I shouldn't say work for. You are a contractor with yeah. uh, Integrity Financial, but anything you want to share with people before we, we go? Uh, I, 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 you, you don't have you to. You just put me in the spot, like a, uh, what is those TV, TV commercials yeah, yeah. that you have to give this quick what, no, you, and you don't 30 have to plug it. I just plugged it, Integrity Financial. Um, <laughs> you don't have to, it's, it's not that. I just want to make sure I'm honoring that opportunity to do that because you've given me, you know, an hour and a half of time. I mean, it's important. Well, appreciate it, appreciate it. Um, you know, why I am with Integrity Financial and Living Well Family Office, um, it, it's the same way the journey that uh, every person is looking for an advisor. But for me, is I came as a client first, that I was looking for certain expertise and so forth uh, until I met with the family. It's owned by Christopher Gray and Julie Gray and uh, his brother uh, Carter Gray and his dad Roland Gray. They all run the you know life insurance. Uh, you know they work with business owners. Uh, do a lot of financial uh, genius work there. But uh, when I came to them, uh, I knew that this is a place, they invited me in. This is a place I would stay uh, for a long time. For the reason that it has all the freedom. It's holistic. Now, let me say this thing. Holistic is not just a complete set of solution yeah. of, you know, this or that. Yeah. Holistic goes back, for me, goes back to that, you know, a father to another father. That I actually get to spend time. I drove 40,000 miles 
tracking the entire Washington, from Spokane to P- Portland. And uh, my clients are business owners as well as individuals as uh, families. But each one of them, uh, you know, they are just private, private people. Uh, so that's why I like about that part. You yeah. know, the holistic is where I'm actually connecting relationally. And also, um, you know, hopefully, I could use any anything that is that is available to me to help them. Yeah, yeah. I would tell anybody listening, um, if you're curious, certainly, I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm going to link you. But I think the most important part about any sort of financial planning or, you know, investments or anything of the like, um, you really do need to look for somebody who has the mindset of a fiduciary that is, that is truly looking out for you. Because the reason the financial industry gets so many negative notices is simple. Yeah. The majority of those businesses are not for you. Yeah. And not to knock the many great individuals, because a lot of great broker dealers out there who are really, really good people. But yeah. guess what? They represent the company, not the client. Yeah, but let me say this on on is that, that is that, that unfair? Regard. No, no, that's fair. But let me add to this: I don't think anybody should be in that position if they're not fiduciary. Period. I agree. Um, but but, it, but it's not that case. It's not. I mean, that, it's the opposite. Yeah. It's about three three quarters to one quarter. As far as in the financial space, there's only about one quarter that are actually an investment advisors that are you know Series sixty five licensed or right. or the like that are fiduciaries, true fiduciaries. Yeah, that's just a starting point. Yeah, getting the series license. This is a starting point. Um, but I think as a firm, you know, uh, fiduciary simply means um, whatever you say, you're accountable. Yeah. Right. Uh, however your advice goes, you're accountable. Yeah, and serving the client's best interest. Exactly. You know, I worked for an insurance company for a number number of years and were taught that term, but when it came down to it, if there was a claim, mm-hmm. I couldn't serve the customer's best interest. Mm-hmm. I represented the company. Right. And that was a real, real eye-opener for me. Right. I just didn't, oh my gosh, that's how it works. <laughs> I don't like this at all. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, so yeah. um, any last thoughts? Before I shut you down, um, shut down. Uh, no, I, I think um, you know. Uh, one last thought for me is that if anyone uh, are curious about you know how is it that there's so many different flavor of, of Christianity, you know that's always been in my mind. Um, I just want to encourage everyone, no matter what your experiences are in the past, good or or not so good. Um, you know, the Word of God is really where I started with. Um, it's always confirming the truth with the truth. Um, so I want to encourage you. It's a long journey, though. I yeah. know a lot of people just open up the Bible and say, oh, my God, it's archaic. I can't yeah. understand it. I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you 100%. Um, but with patience, if it's important to you, I, I know that uh, uh, you're going to find truth. And uh, nothing more that I want in this set of my life. I don't know how long I'm going to live, but I don't want to live in deception. Yeah. Right. So I want truth. Perfect. Uh, Yep. Perfect. I love you, buddy. Love you too. All right. Thanks for, thanks for being here today and, um, helping me out. I appreciate this. This is really cool. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for taking time. Rock and roll. roll.